Was tun Hackerinnen und Hacker? Die Hacker Spaces, die wir im vorigen Video beschrieben bekommen haben, bieten die Infrastruktur, um zu entwickeln, um Probleme zu lösen. Sie sind Kulturstädte und sind gemeinschaftlich organisierte Räume, sind weltweit einerseits völlig unterschiedlich, aber doch auch verbunden durch Werte und durch eine Haltung. Man könnte es eine Doing, not Talking Mentalität nennen. Oder wie der Leitspruch lautet, don't talk too much, get on with it, try it out, see what happens. Diese Mentalität ist immer konstruktiv und nicht destruktiv auf das Gestalten und Ausreizen von Möglichkeiten, die uns Technologien bieten, ausgerichtet. Steckt in Ihnen vielleicht auch etwas von dieser Mentalität? So in the last video, I introduced hacking a little bit and more specifically hacker and maker spaces, these spaces that I am particularly interested in. The next question then is to think a bit more about what happens in these spaces. What do hackers do? What goes on in hacker and maker spaces? Again, this is perhaps a slightly difficult question to answer. You can do whatever you want in a hacker or maker space. Hacking is self-directed. It's about you following your passions and interests and enthusiasms. So all kinds of different things can go on in a hacker and maker spaces. Just as the spaces themselves look very different, uh, the projects that people carry out are also extremely diverse. More than anything, hacker and maker spaces give access to tools so that you can follow your interests and your ideas. So if you've always wanted to 3D print uh, a particular kind of design, if you want to uh, hack together your own furniture, uh, if you want to develop clothing that is exactly to your specifications, if you want to develop your own software uh, as a business idea, Hacker and Maker Spaces allow you to learn how to do these things uh, and give you access to the tools that will help you to do that. So hacking is self-directed and Hacker Spaces enable you to follow your own passions and interests and enthusiasms. When we visited Hacker and Maker Spaces though, it was clear that one thing did unite the very different projects that people were working on um, in those hacker and maker spaces. People said that their projects were cool. Uh, they wanted to do cool projects. What did that mean, we asked? What made a project cool? The people that we spoke to said that this wasn't about a particular idea of cool, what was in fashion or anything like that. Rather, what made a project cool was the fact that you were enthusiastic about it, that it was your passion, that you were able to really geek out in a particular thing, very specialized thing perhaps, um, that you really cared about. Cool projects were projects that you were excited about, that were perhaps new and unique and were an expression of you and your identity. What did this look like in practice? The spaces that we visited were supporting many different projects from having do-it-yourself biology labs where people were learning to sequence DNA so that they could check what their sushi actually was, whether it was what the restaurant was selling it as. Several places had uh, projects where individuals or groups were building robots, for instance, to serve uh, drinks, to mix cocktails, to make um, bubble machines, uh, so robots were particularly uh, popular because they merged this kind of mechanical technology also with electronics. People were also working on fabric uh, projects. So for instance, integrating electronics into your own clothing so that you could uh, put LEDs into a sweatshirt that would uh, light up in a particular design at night. There were software projects and people working on uh, developing uh, different forms of computing. So this might be anything from capture the flag contests where teams of hackers were competing in an online space to uh, 
individuals developing new software or apps as business ideas. So projects used very different kinds of technologies uh, and they were insistently individual. So projects were about you uh, doing what you're interested in. So this perhaps gives you some sense of what was going on in these spaces, what people were working on. Another question is how these spaces were organized in practice. Were they just open so that you could come in at any time? Uh, some of them were, yes. Uh, as I've said, the spaces themselves could be very different. They looked very different, but most of them had as an ideal, at least, the idea of public accessibility. At least some of the time, anyone from the community can come in and access these tools, learn how to use them and develop their ideas. Hackerspaces are also, of course, organizations, and they are generally uh, collective and democratic, sometimes even anarchistic organizations. So there were often collective meetings and discussion where decisions were made about how to run the space. People perhaps came together once a week to see each other and to make choices about how to operate the, the hacker and maker space. Of course, this is a, uh, these are spaces that are using cutting edge technology. They also had digital ways of keeping in touch and organizing themselves. Uh, so as well as the physical space, which was very important for meeting and uh, learning from each other, uh, there was also email lists, wikis, uh, increasingly social media accounts as well. If we ask though, how these spaces were organized, how did they really operate in practice? One idea came up repeatedly, and this was the notion of duocracy. Uh, so the notion that just doing things was extremely important. Uh, rather than talking too much, rather than designing committees and structures, what you should do was do. So for instance, here's a quote from one of our interviewees that we spoke to. And he said about his space, we action. What separates us from so many other people in the world is that we're not sitting there having a conference, having a focus group, getting approval from the executives, raising the funding with car washes. No, we're like, what can we do right now to make this thing a reality? Even if it's small, even if it's shitty, make the first step, get the ball rolling, see what happens. If it needs to be approved, get it approved. They weren't totally uh, illegal, uh, but he says, do the bare minimum. I'm the king of doing the bare minimum. So this encapsulates this duocracy approach. Don't talk too much, get on with it, try it out, see what happens. This notion of duocracy relates to something else that people, the people that we spoke to told us when they were explaining what it meant to be a hacker and to be involved in a hacker or maker space. Our interviewees, uh, hackers and makers, they told us that they lived according to a particular spirit or lifestyle. So hacking for them wasn't so much about knowing particular techniques or working with particular technologies or being interested in particular kinds of stuff. Rather, hacking was a way of life, more than a, a set of um, ability to be involved with computers or technology, for instance. What did this lifestyle involve? A number of things. Duocracy was certainly one of them. So an attitude where you were doing things, you were being active, you were getting on. But hackers also spoke about the importance of making things, of being constructive and creative. In fact, the hackers that we spoke to explicitly said that they saw themselves as true hackers because they were not destroying stuff. When they talked about black hat hacking, uh, dangerous hacking that was, for instance, taking down other people's businesses or websites or stealing money, this was seen as the antithesis of the true hacker spirit because hacking was about being constructive, not destructive. Another aspect of being a hacker was curiosity. 
a desire to understand how things work. So not being content with the black box of a computer or a car, but really wanting to unpack it to know what's going on under the surface. One of the people we spoke to told us that they really wanted uh, a robot vacuum cleaner. These were very new at the time, but they knew they couldn't let themselves buy one because they would instantly uh, take it to pieces and they weren't sure that they would be able to get it back working again. Being a hacker is about this deep desire to understand under the surface how things are working. Once you understand how things work, you might also be able to intervene in that to make things work better for you, but perhaps also more generally, you might be able to improve on particular tools or technologies. Hacking was also about improvement in that sense. The hackers that we spoke to also were clear that hacking, being a hacker, was not only about these characteristics, it was also, um, as we saw before, as people spoke about their projects, passion and enthusiasm. So being a hacker wasn't a laid-back, distance activity, it was something that you were excited about. Uh, your curiosity was overflowing. Finally, this hacker spirit also involved relating to other people. Community was central to hacking, very different to this imagination of the hacker as an isolated person. Community was important and through that community, you would learn, you would share your knowledge and you would together work in hands-on ways. It's these things that for the people that we spoke to defined hacking and being a hacker. And what's striking, of course, is that this, these are characteristics that are not limited to engagement with computing or even technology. These are things that any of us might lay claim to or aspire to. So my final question then is if anyone can be a hacker, if anyone can take on these characteristics, are you perhaps also a hacker, even without knowing it?